Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Welcome to uh, this virtual meeting at CSIS. Uh, let me start by saying that Treasury is having some technical difficulties, so Tom will be joining us uh, in a few minutes. Uh, in the interval, we decided to go ahead and start uh, because the, there's been a lot of changes to CFIUS uh, since FIRMA, dramatic changes, and some of them come into effect pretty soon. The format here will be conversational. When Tom arrives, he will make some opening remarks, but in the interval, uh, we'll go ahead and start talking about what uh, what's up with CFIUS. There will be time for a few questions at the end that you can ask for all three of us uh, when we're on. Um, let me introduce the two panelists who have uh, hooked up on uh, on Zoom. Uh, the first is uh, Dave Hankey from Aaron Fox. He was the staff architect of FIRMA and now as a practice that looks at CFIUS and foreign trade and national security. Um, joining him is Nova Daly at Wiley Rhine. Uh, Nova was the DAS in the investment security part of Treasury a few years ago. And so both people who've done extensive work on CFIUS, extensive work on, work on FIRMA. And I think we'll just start with them. Um, what do you think the changes are going to be like? I mean, we're looking at major changes in, what, a couple weeks, three weeks? Uh, I don't know, Dave, do you want to start? Is this what you had in mind? Sure, maybe I'll just uh, make some sort of opening comments on uh, on FIRMA just to uh, kind of set the stage if it's okay. I know Nova's kind of the king of mandatory declarations, so maybe I'll let him field that one specifically, <laughs> okay. But um, I thought I'd kind of uh, dust off my old policy hat, <clears throat> take off my law firm hat for today's event. That's kind of what it, what it requires, but a quick refresher on uh, on the origins of FIRMA. You know, this was, uh, this was a, a law that was aimed squarely at, uh, at China's efforts to acquire technology by any means possible. And there were four really kind of underlying objectives of the bill, uh, which is now law. Uh, one is to uh, make CFIUS more efficient. Two was to um, maximize certainty and predictability for the transaction parties. Three was to ensure that CFIUS gets enough resources to do the additional work that uh, Congress asked it to do. And then fourth and most importantly, was to close up the three specific jurisdictional gaps that we identified in the through the legislation, uh, which we can talk about in a minute, but really to prevent circumvention of CFIUS by closing up those gaps. Um, on resourcing and on the certainty predictability question, I think uh, that's, been, that's been really well established. I think uh, CFIUS really nailed that one. And uh, so I want to focus really on sort of assessing how they're doing on process and how they're doing on substance. And on process, uh, just a few, a few key points. Um, I want to give a ton of credit here to uh, Tom and to his team, including Laura Black, for a really, I think, excellent set of regulations that, um, that really, they clearly put a ton of effort in here, but it makes CFIUS just a lot more efficient. It's, it's, in a lot of ways, it's exactly what we had in mind when we were writing the legislation in, in 2017 and 2018. A few highlights, um, the, there's a new online CFIUS portal, which uh, for CFIUS nerds is very exciting. Nova will tell you about the days back in, uh, I don't know, the, uh, I won't tell you which. The, the Stone Age. Yeah. The Stone <laughs> Age. 2007 and 2009. It used to be all, all paper, but now it's, uh, it's online and, and there's a new system called the case management system, which Tom will probably talk about. It's a work in progress, but it's, I think, a step up. Um, in FIRMA, one of the important things that the Homeland Security Department lobbied for was 15 extra days on the front end, uh, so the sort of phase one, the review process, and Treasury went along with that, and in Congress, we, we okayed that too, and I think um, this has enabled a lot more deals to get the CFIUS green light in that first phase without getting kicked into the, the second, the sort of investigation stage, so that's a big positive. Um, the short form filing is called a declaration. Something that I uh, thought up and put in there was really important. You know, I, I originally envisioned this as a voluntary only thing where investors could, could do kind of a fast track, you know, sort of trusted investors, low risk investors could avail themselves of this fast track process. And I think that's sort of a work in progress as well, but it's coming along. Um, the short form filing is, uh, is quite good. And then some, uh, somebody named Nova Daly came in and suggested that maybe we should uh, also make that mandatory 
in certain circumstances like state-owned enterprises investing in companies. And so that, uh, that, that was done as well. So now we have the short form voluntary and mandatory <laughs> filings, which is interesting. But, um, and then uh, lastly, we have the safe list. It's been called various things. I call it the safe list, the country specification authority, which CFIUS has used to uh, put on you know, the UK, Canada and Australia in, in kind of the good guys list which in a lot of cases exempts uh, investors from those countries from the need for CFIUS review of these additional types of, uh, of transactions. Jim, you want to go to Tom since he just uh, jumped in there? How are well, you? I, I, thanks, for, uh, thanks for joining, Tom. Sorry for the technical difficulties. We were going to go to someone who's been described as the king of mandatory filings, but since, since you're here, um, maybe you could start with some opening remarks. And just to quickly reiterate, uh, remarks from each of you, conversational discussion of what we're doing in CFIUS, and then if we have time at the end, uh, a few questions from the audience. But Tom, if you want to go ahead and start, that'd be great. Sure, that sounds great. Can you all hear me fine? Mm -hmm. Great. So I've been listening the whole time. It sounds like you guys don't need me to, to participate. Uh, I, you had to promote me to a speaker, so uh, happy to be here and, and join the conversation. <clears throat> Uh, uh, Dave's exactly right. The, the declarations were intended to, um, uh, to streamline the filing process and over time, I think, to make sure that, um, that uh, there was a way for benign transactions based on institutional knowledge, good legal advice, and, um, and, and a developing sort of familiarity with the declaration process so that uh, benign transactions could get a more efficient uh, and clear answer from the committee and move on with business, right? So that uh, we could continue to protect national security, but do so in an open investment environment. And so far, you know, we saw exactly that at the start. There was fits and starts in, in the context of the declarations in the pilot program, but we're seeing uh, a great deal of efficiency now and, and a fine tuning and a positive feedback loop on, on the types of filings we're seeing in declarations and the, the rate of clearance. Somewhere around two thirds of all declarations get a safe harbor letter currently. So uh, I, I definitely uh, it's nice to see legislation implemented through regulations the right way and for it to have the right, right effect. So that's been great. Um, you know, it's been it's been uh, a year since I last spoke at this event, uh, and none of us could have imagined how much would be different today, uh, and including this. I'd much rather be speaking with you all in person, but uh, appreciate this opportunity. And so, you know, there's been a lot of change for the government too, and and Cifius, uh I can comment specifically, and and we've managed to improvise and adapt and really keep chugging along both with respect to timely implementation of FIRMA. Uh, the regulations had a statutory deadline of, of February of this year, and we managed to do that right on time. You don't always see that with, uh, with implementation of, of statutory mandates, and, and we rocked and rolled and got that done. Uh, we, uh, we've also been managing the CFIUS process and, and the filing of transactions. And, and juggling that chainsaw as well with a great deal of efficiency. Dave also mentioned the extra 15 days on the review period. And, um, and that's been quite effective in, in making sure that, uh, that benign transactions or easy transactions, if you will, uh, get their safe harbor before having to go into the investigation phase. Um, I think if I can just look at my notes here and see what's worth uh, bringing up on, on my opening remarks. Uh, you know, I agree, uh, CFIUS was, uh, FIRMA was uh, a very significant piece of legislation, a generational change in modernizing and strengthening this national security tool. And, um, uh, you know, giving us the ability to look at certain non-controlling minority investments. There was a big change in that in that generation in that what, roughly 12 years not quite a generation but you guys get my point in the complexity and the volume of filings with with the committee and so we really did have to retool and, and firma 
gave us a lot of uh, flexibility and frankly, authority to be nimble in the future without waiting for another uh, statute or uh, additional legislation to come along. And that's our intent here, right? It's the regulations are implemented. We've just rolled out uh, critical technology um, uh, mandatory declaration uh, retool of, of, of that piece of the regulations. And we intend to, to develop and continue a positive feedback loop where, where we'll be watching what kind, kinds of filings are coming in, uh, where there may be gaps, where there's not enough clarity for the bar and for stake, external stakeholders. And we'll continue to use our authority under FIRMA to, um, to fine tune the legislation and to respond to evolving, um, <clears throat> excuse me, evolving threats and, and the evolving nature of, of uh, commercial transactions. I think it, uh, you know, I could keep talking, but I'll just stop there and, and let uh, uh, Nova and Dave chime in. Dave, uh, were you going to add anything? <clears throat> no, I think uh, Tom framed it up well. He's uh, obviously running the show, and uh, you know, there's a lot to uh, compliment with the way Treasury has implemented the uh, the statute, with uh, on the process side especially, and, and in most cases on the substance side. Um, we can talk <clears throat> if you want to about about some of my criticisms, which are not really aimed at Treasury, but aimed at your alma mater, the Commerce Department, Jim. And uh, I can do that now <laughs> later in the program as you as you desire. Yeah, we fell off schedule. I forgot to introduce Tom. Thomas Fetto, Assistant Secretary for Investment Security. Thanks for being here. Um, now we'll get back on track, I hope. Uh, Nova, do you want to talk it? And we can, we'll come back to Commerce. I'm not shielding them. Uh, but Nova, do you want to talk about mandatory filing, what you're seeing going on? Sure. Thanks. And, uh, you know, uh, I was in the hot seat with Fedo uh, a generation ago, uh, uh, back when uh, FINSA, FINSA got passed, falling to buy ports world blow up. And new law, you have to write the regulations, you have to get them out, uh, implement them, uh, reform the process. It's a lot to do. Uh, and uh, especially things that are much more complex uh, now in terms of the nature of the investments. So I give uh, kudos to Treasury for getting those regulations out and and really working to, to get the process right. It's hard because uh, you got 15 other agencies that you got to bring consensus to uh, on these decisions. It's not like Treasury can just do it on its own. So it's a lot of work just uh, coordinating that. Anyway, some of the things I've, I've sort of uh, seen in, in terms of the process, and Dave has touched on uh, some really important ones as well as Tom. Uh, you know, there's the importance of addressing non notified transactions. Um, and Treasury's done a good job at doing that from, from what I can see. And it's so critically important. Now, if you don't know, non-notified transactions are ones that are covered transactions that may have national security you know, considerations that need to be addressed. But because it's a voluntary process, for the most part, parties can choose not to file them. Uh, that is a big Achilles heel. And, and I saw that back in 2007, 2009. Because you, have a, you could have a transaction that occurs, creates a huge vulnerability for US national security, but they never file because it's voluntary. And suddenly it gets found, it gets found by the Hill, and then you have a blow up like Dubai Ports World. So uh, I'm really glad that Treasury is addressing it. Look, I mean, the problem is that there are actors out there that uh, either uh, will act through companies that can cause serious vulnerabilities to, to the United States. And so it's important that they get identified. You know, on the mandatory declaration side, um, you know, uh, you know, that was, uh, as Dave said, that was one of the things I thought, uh, was important to address, especially, uh, and for me, it was, you know, at first very narrow, it was state owned enterprises. Uh, and then obviously if it's expanded it to address sort of the critical technology side, which I think is important, but you know, one of the things we wanted to address there are, you know, uh, state owned enterprises or enterprises controlled and operated by the state, you know, they can operate on. Uh, non-market principles, and they may make investments for strategic reasons rather than market principles. So that's why I thought it was imperative that uh, we address those and that there be a differentiation between private entities and state-owned entities in terms of investing in the United States, especially if they're going to compete with U.S. private entities in the U.S. on national security in the national security market. It could have detrimental effects on, on, on market players, and I, I thought it needed to be addressed. Now, uh, now, the CFIUS law firma had a 10% threshold uh, with a waiver, 
uh, and the regulations came out uh, 25 and 50 percent in terms of 25 percent ownership and 50 percent state owned uh, state ownership. Uh, so it might have been uh, it might be useful to examine that uh, because you can get control under those under those thresholds, uh, and you may see a lot of things that are voluntary that should uh, be mandatorily filed. But nonetheless, uh, Treasury's doing a great job on the mandatory filings. So, uh, but that's just one area I think could be addressed more on the policy side. Um, and uh, another thing I wanted to cover too, well, actually two things real quickly. One is the importance of engaging our international partners. Um, you know, uh, I think the language in the, in the firm of law was should, should build a process and Treasury did, which is great. Uh, you know, there's a lot happening in that space. The EU has a new law, Japan has a new law. And um, interestingly, a recent report came out from uh, uh, an entity in Europe saying that Chinese, SO, Chinese uh, uh, SOEs were behind 650 investments in Europe that never really got identified, and, and especially in the high technology space. So it's important that we interact with our allies on their national security regimes and the national security issues that we share in common as allies, uh, whether it spans just investment or export controls as well. And the last thing I want to touch upon is uh, enforcement, uh, enforcement provisions. Uh, Treasury put it on its website where it takes enforcement actions on mitigation agreements. So critical because you can uh, do a transaction, have a, uh, a number of uh, uh, sort of things that a company needs to follow, the foreign company needs to follow in terms of implementing security structures. But if it's not enforced, uh, you know, you really, it's just a piece of paper. So uh, Treasury is making that public and putting it on its website. Uh, there's two actions out there. I think it's great. Uh, and I just think there needs the, you know, the continued vigilance on that side is, uh, is important. So with that, I turn it over to the group. Thanks. And Tom, maybe you can take a minute and talk about um, how you've been engaging with our European partners. They have a, they all have a requirement to develop national regulations in response to an EU directive. Uh, have they reached out to you? Are you talking with them? Uh, how's that going on the international side? Yeah, uh, thanks. There's actually two points at that and something else Nova mentioned that I'd like to touch on. Uh, the non-notified piece is critically important to to our work, and and uh, you know Dave and and the folks that helped to to draft the legislation made sure that non-notifieds were specifically called out in the legislation as an important focus of our work, right? And so I think I mentioned last October that we actually retooled the team at Treasury to build out an independent office in my in my team that's dedicated to enforcement and to non-notified work and, and the mitigation agreements. Mm -hmm. And so we've, uh, you know, I think you've even seen some recent reporting on, on that non-notified work. And as we build out the resources and the people to do that, we'll be paying attention to the types of transactions that are going on uh, and calling them in or inviting more for more information when appropriate. And I think that'll also inform Nova's mention of the the, the calibration of the um, the mandatory filings. To the extent we're missing the sweet spot, there we'll be able to, with our non-notified work, paying attention to the to the transaction landscape and and adjust if we need to. Um, uh, in terms of the international relations piece, that was also called out in Firma as an area that we needed to develop. And we have, we have an international relations office within my shop. And I think over the last two years since FIRMA was enacted, we've had 300 or so engagements with uh, about 60 different allies and partners on this issue. That is investment screening for national security purposes. And so we've been uh, busily involved with uh, our Five Eyes partners, we've done a lot of work with the EU, We've uh, reached out to a number of uh, allies to, uh, to benchmark and to, um, to begin to share information and think about sharing information. And during the course of the pandemic, I corresponded with a number of our allies and partners, uh, impressing upon them the importance of this issue and having effective investment screening in the context of, of the pandemic and potential depressed assets and, and targets within their own jurisdiction. So we've been very, very busy in this area. 
So maybe the big change, at least that I was looking at, and one of the reasons I thought it would be useful to get us all together would be to talk about the the upcoming rule, or it's actually out, but it goes into effect soon on critical technology mandatory filing requirements. I think that's the one of the big changes. I got to learn a new acronym, which was TID, uh, Technology Infrastructure and Data. Um, where where are we on that stuff? Let's start with technology first. Uh, I don't know who wants, Dave, do you want to start? But this is what you had in mind, right? That we would reach out and touch this stuff. Uh, what what do you think about the mandatory filing as it stands now? Well, I think the um, I think the mandatory filing rule that kicks in in in, uh, in two weeks on uh, yeah. technologies is is very well written. It uh, you know requires a uh, an analysis on the export control side of uh, what kinds of technology transfers are indeed sensitive and and to what kinds of um, individuals and entities. And so I think it's a big improvement over the um, you know the the system that was built <coughs> program, which was based on census codes and you know, there were some. Yeah criticize that. Of course, Tom got that done on the back of a napkin in 60 days. So it was pretty darn good in light of the uh, constraints. But um, yeah, I think the new rule is quite good. Jim, can I turn and just maybe just talk about the um, on the technology side in terms of the uh, implementation more broadly beyond the mandatory filings? Yeah, I, we have to do that. So <laughs> yeah, so you know, I started to talk about the process and I was going to talk about the substance in terms of assessing um, implementation. And you know, if you recall, the uh, legislation was aimed at, at three three gaps. And uh, the first one that I want to flag has nothing to do with technology. It was standalone real estate. And Tom and his team created a separate, a whole separate reg, the 802 uh, series reg, which is quite good and very nuanced. And I've been advising some clients on that. I think it squarely addresses the problem in a in a, in a way that's not overly broad and it's it's fairly specific. The second one, which uh, you and I have talked about more than once, is uh, overseas joint ventures and what you might call foundational technologies. And it, because there was some friction and some resistance from industry and also from the Commerce Department, the entire part of FIRMA that, that would have given CFIUS jurisdiction over those was offloaded to the, uh, to the Commerce Department. So it's not Tom's problem anymore. I'm sure he's heartbroken about that. But uh, unfortunately, the joint venture problem has not been addressed. and um, it kind of dovetails with the third gap that we originally were aimed at in Congress, which was the uh, Chinese backed venture capital investments in emerging technology companies in places like Silicon Valley and Austin, Texas, Boston, you name it. And, um, you know, I think on the, the regulations really do a good job of, uh, <clears throat> of laying it out through the TID analysis that you mentioned, but, you know, there's an important kind of handoff that happens in the statute to the Commerce Department. And CFIUS is totally dependent on BIS to designate, to identify and control, to use the words of the statute, emerging technologies as well as foundational technologies. And I know that uh, BIS has a predisposition and, and it's the right, the right one to favor multilateral controls over unilateral, which is what the emerging and foundational control would, would be. But um, I think requiring CFIUS to wait on a 40, I think 43 member consortium, the Vassanar arrangement, to decide on what the jurisdiction of CFIUS should be. Um, you know, I, I actually own part of the blame for that. That was a really bad idea. And uh, I think it needs to be relooked because, because uh, there needs to be more agility. You know, there just needs to be more speed, the ability for Tom and his team to, uh, to see something coming and uh, whether or not it's covered by, you know, by uh, BIS and the, and the Commerce Control List to be able to, to designate that in a quick manner and to review that for national security risks. That's the way the system should work. And through some last minute maneuvering by opponents of FIRMA, we're stuck with the current uh, deeply flawed system. And um, you know, I'll just point out that there's, there are a lot of critics on the Hill about the current state of play too. There is a, uh, there's a, a bill by Senator Tillis and Congressman Mike Gallagher, which would uh, address this specific point and also yesterday, there was the, uh, the House Republican China Task Force put out a scathing report. Um, well, it was, it was a very broad report. One of the things they addressed was this particular issue, and they proposed handing off the specific function to someone other than Commerce. So if Commerce doesn't find some motivation, they're going to be sidelined uh, perhaps in the next year on this, on this specific issue. So I'll stop ranting there, but I want to point out that, you know, that this, in this particular issue, um, you know, the rocket has not necessarily blown up on the launch pad, but I'm just not sure that there's any gas or fuel in the tank 
uh, when it comes to designating these technologies, there needs to be a little bit more urgency on the part of uh, our friends at Commerce. So. I, I promised people that one of the ground rules uh, for this discussion is that we wouldn't bring up uh, a company who sounds like a clock. But I forgot to say that we should probably also make, uh, make uh, Commerce off limits. I might have been the one that said the Wassenaar arrangement to you, so I feel a little guilty. Um, but that is how we do it. And, you know, moving, I, the question maybe for Nova and Tom is, what do you do about transactions that aren't controlled technologies? And we know one of the reasons that ECRA, the Export Control Reform Act set up, mandated that commerce begin processes to identify emerging foundational technologies is because some of the things we might be most concerned about aren't currently controlled. I agree with you, Wassenaar is a clunky progress process, but it's a little out of the bailiwick of CFIUS, but uh, Tom Nova, I don't know. I'd love to know how you catch stuff that isn't on the list. So um, maybe you could start with that. Nova, you could save Tom by answering that question. Tom, I, 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 I give great deference to our, uh, our administrative uh, voice. So you can go ahead, or if you want me to start it out, I don't care. So I'll just, I'll just uh, um, say a couple of things. I think we need to be a little bit careful about what is in or isn't in scope with respect to CFIUS regulations. I'm not going to uh, tip, tip our hand with respect to uh, jurisdictional analysis in the, this sort of context, but not all joint ventures are outside the scope of, of, of the committee. And in fact, we, we with some frequency do look at, at joint ventures of, of the type where a U.S. business is contributed to that joint venture and, and the foreign person has control. Uh, any transaction where we find control by a foreign person over a U.S. business, the technology doesn't need to be on a commerce control list or otherwise controlled in order for us to address any potential national security risks. So I appreciate Dave's points uh, and greatly respect Dave, but uh, you know, there are some nuances to this. I also think, you know, commerce, uh, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not uh, export controls expert and uh, I wish commerce were here to defend themselves on, on the point, but I think they might make, make some argument that they're making a great deal of progress, but uh, I'll just leave it right there. Yeah. So, um, uh, thanks, Tom. That's that's it's true. It's it's difficult, and and you know uh, one of our uh, one of our friends, sort of on the on on the CFIUS law and getting it passed, Cordell Hall is uh, shepherding that shop over at the Commerce Department, and I know he's familiar with CFIUS and the importance of getting it right. It's difficult, I mean, to identify an emerging and foundational technology, and once it's identified, that becomes one of the technologies that are critical technologies and require mandatory filing. So I understand the difficulty of it, but I mean, there's some instructive, you know, markers out there. I mean, what's interesting to me and not to get uh, into investment reciprocity too much, but you know, a recent uh, congressional report, which uh, David, you cited the U S China task force. I mean, they found 40 industries, including cloud computing, telecommunications, internet related services that are on the PRC's foreign investment national negative list, meaning U S companies can't invest there. Uh, in terms of a controlling investment or have ownership, whereas the Chinese can do it here. So, I mean, maybe that list of uh, uh, companies and technologies could be instructive to what they're doing. Um, I understand it's a hard list. List emerging technologies shift and change. Foundational technologies, you know, what are, are they on the list already? Are they semiconductors? But look, you have to, you know, it's a it's a requirement by law, and I think it it will help. Uh, uh, CFIUS do its job in terms of being able to make sure we don't lose those critical technologies. And obviously, Commerce can go ahead and work within the WASNAR arrangements, and then Treasury can obviously work uh, internationally with our partners on the investment regime. So there's a way to do it on multi levels, but you just got to get you got to get some out there. So yeah, I should note that uh, we've been talking to Commerce about having them come and speak, and the timing just didn't work out. So they're they're interested in doing it, and I'd like to have them on as soon as we can. Uh, it just didn't, the timing turned out to be not ideal. So thanks to all of you for making it. Uh, I, this, this came up during the discussions with the bill though. I mean that you remember you were talking about maybe having treasury come up with the list of things and 
ended up being punted to commerce, which I think is the right place. But there's some unhappiness about the pace of change. Um, a lot of that has to do with China. I don't know. Tom, do you want to, how much is China a headache for you? Have all the Chinese cases gone away or do you still get Chinese investors coming in? I know last year it was down by 75%, although some of that reflects Chinese, China's own investment rules. But what's the status of China now in that process? Yeah, so I think, uh, so you've seen uh, the committee's gotten up to speed and up to date on our annual reports over the last year or so. We've, we've uh, released three or four annual reports and we're currently up to date. In 2018, I think the number of Chinese transactions that the committee considered was somewhere around uh, 55 and, and in 2019, that number was 25. So a substantial change, but still significant. Um, I think in 2019, our, our um, largest uh, uh, geographic filing area was, was from Japan. And we're also seeing that in terms of past uh, declarations. Now, of course, declarations are open to any transaction within our jurisdiction, not just the pilot program or not just with respect to mandatory filings, but across the board. So it'll be interesting over 2020 to see what the final numbers look like. But yeah, we do still see uh, China-related transactions and and uh, we're, we're paying attention in the non-notified space to to uh, a number of different uh, transactions as well. Uh, Nova or Dave, if you had a Chinese investor come in, what advice would you give them? Yeah, assuming it was reasonable, it wasn't uh, DOA, what advice would you give them? I sent them over to Nova for starters. <laughs> That's something to give. <laughs> well, that was an easy one. <laughs> uh, now, Dave, why don't you go ahead, Nelson? Uh, you know, honestly, um, when we were writing the legislation, one of the uh, one of the underlying themes was that um, you know not all Chinese investment, not all any investment, even from the devil himself, you know, is is really risky for national security under certain conditions. And those conditions really being you know purely truly passive investment, where the investor is really just seeking a return and has you know very little in the way of rights or information that would not be available to someone with internet access. That in that kind of situation, the uh, the investment is really just beneficial for the U.S. company under those conditions, and you put in place the right safeguards, and, and China should be able to invest in uh, in almost any type of company. So, uh, you know, my advice to uh, Chinese investors would be, you know, find a passive arrangement. Um, you know, welcome to America. This economy is open for business. You know, we we want everyone to have opportunities and make money. I know that's that's uh, Tom's philosophy as well. He can speak for himself, but. I'd say they need to be realistic about their prospects for gaining clearance from CFIUS, and they need to structure things in a way that reflects, you know, legitimate, real-life national security concerns and dynamics. Yeah, yeah. My, you know, my view is like obviously a passive investment uh, demonstrates that you're there for, uh, you know, the market principles and not strategic purposes. But I'd say if you're getting into the the, the controlling aspect, uh, becoming, you know, getting into a covered transaction space, you know, uh, uh, maybe stay away from the critical technology space. Maybe stay, I mean, there's some clear elements, uh, uh, industries and technologies out there where you know there's going to be high sensitivity. So uh, maybe avoid those. Um, and then if you do get in the CFIUS process, you know, be v very transparent, uh, you know, Unfortunately, a lot of these Chinese transactions have very complex ownership structures that are opaque. That may be the nature of the system in China, but even before you do the transaction in the United States, you know, get that all clear. Make sure it's very apparent who's controlling and, and, uh, and how it's going to be structured. But it's, a, you know, it's obviously a difficult time. There's uh, some past precedent that have made it difficult for Chinese investors. And then uh, that's why transparency and avoidance of some areas might be the right path. Right, we're starting to get a few questions from the audience. If you uh, uh, are out there and have a question you wanna ask, uh, now's a good time. Uh, let me start with, uh, I think the first one we got, which is, I'll just read it. How impactful has the safe list been in driving policy reform in allied countries? Uh, the ones that currently aren't on the safe list is it an incentive for them to, uh, to uh, uh, improve their system? How, 
how can countries, and the second part of the question is, how can countries get on the safe list? What do they have to do? So what is it you look for and what is it that Nova Davey would advise somebody? Um, I would, my advice, we just did, finished a study at CSIS on Chinese investment in Nordic countries. And my, my first bit of advice would be, we'll have, have rules in place. That's a good start. But uh, Tom, I, what would you tell people? And then we can turn to Dave and uh, Nova. Yeah. So I, th I think the regulations give a, a great deal of guidance on this and, and also um, our website in terms of what we're looking for. But the standard is to have a robust and effective investment screening mechanism. I mean, that's, that's the threshold. And so a number of countries are, uh, I think, at least it appears to me, incentivized to, to respond to, um, to, to the uh, the business environment and to the complexity of transactions and and the realities of of the world and uh, certainly the pandemic has has motivated uh, folks to relook at this issue and 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 focus. You've seen that in uh, New Zealand and Australia and the United Kingdom and throughout the EU. A number of countries that had systems have re-energized those. Um, made modifications and and so it's not clear to me whether it's the accepted foreign state list which remember is is an exemption only with respect to parts of our new jurisdiction and only with respect to an investor that meets uh, a very narrow set of 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 threshold so i think um you know we have seen a, a great deal of engagement from certain allies and partners on this and 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 we're talking to them about it on on our website, we have the, the, the factors. It's not an exclusive list that, that we take into consideration in the course of, of doing that analysis. Great, uh, Nova, Dave, anything you wanna to add to that? Yeah, I mean, if I had, 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 were advising a, you know, a, foreign, a foreign entity on, on getting on that exempted list, I, you know, I think everything sort of uh, uh, Tom said in terms of look at what's publicly out there and then you know, engage the United States government in, in a strong dialogue. And then look to the laws you do have in terms of your investment screening regime and see how you can uh, bolster it and tighten it up. I mean, obviously one of the clear issues and reasons why uh, FIRMA was enacted, as David said, was uh, we have an issue with some of the ways certain Chinese entities are conducting themselves um, uh, and the state in certain instances as well. So, um, you know, be ready to address those issues. Jim Tom's the authoritative source. He's the one dealing with these foreign governments. But I will say that during the legislative drafting, we had just innumerable meetings with foreign governments who were asking this very question and, in fact, lobbying to sort of uh, get some congressional action to make sure they got on the list. And, of course, we were deferential to the executive branch on, on doing that. But you know, the U.S. remains a global leader in, in all kinds of different areas, including this one. And whether there was a list or not, I think other countries would be standing up uh, cfius like processes, which is which is very positive. But I do think the the intent uh, behind this provision, which is for it to be a carrot for these countries to stand up these processes, is also playing a big role. So I'm very pleased by that. But um, kudos to Tom for a great job implementing this provision. Uh, we got a few more questions, and uh, some of them I'm going to skip unless someone feels particularly brave, like people are asking about. Uh, case histories, and I, you know, I don't know if we can really talk about NVIDIA and ARM, but uh, you can think about it while we go ahead. Someone else asked, are we going to see something like uh, COCOM, the Coordinating Committee for Multilateral Export Controls, that was, uh, I think, in the Reagan administration. Um, uh, will that come in for foreign investment? And I'll, I'll tackle that one a little bit, but by saying that we're never going to see another COCOM because COCOM had a provision that allowed members to veto a transaction. So if the U.S. saw a French or German transaction it didn't like, it could veto it. And having negotiated some of this stuff 15 years later, uh, the Europeans are not ready for a return of the veto. In fact, they may never be ready. But what about the idea of a formal mechanism? Is that something that's worth thinking about, worth exploring? And I'll say that in, in the interviews we did with European uh, governments for this investment project, um, most of them expressed a desire for some kind of assistance from the US. How formal is another matter, but almost all of them said, you know, 
we're, we're mainly small countries. We could use your help. Is a formal mechanism the right way to go? <clears throat> You're all going to dodge that one, aren't you? I'm going to take the first one because I'm not sure I understand the second one, but uh, I'm not sure that we need to return to COCOM, but what I think here in, in 2020 is appropriate is a reluck of, uh, of how we do multilateral export controls. And, you know, I think um, the, uh, the House Committee report that we're talking about, the task force report makes a recommendation on this, but there's also a specific bill that was introduced uh, just two weeks ago by Congressman Mike McCall from Texas, who chaired that task force. And it really calls for a, a broader use of uh, plurilateral export control bodies. And I think what, what they're talking about is that you know, when you look at something like artificial intelligence or semiconductors, not every country in Bostonar should have an equal voice in, in decisions about how to control that stuff because a lot of them have nothing to do with it. So let's take the countries that have the expertise and the, the sort of industrial base, the R&D base that do that, do those things, and let's put them in little sort of ad hoc groups and let them decide on how to control those individual types of technologies. It'd be much more nimble faster, more relevant, and it'll give the United States, uh, I think, increased, uh, increased voice in these areas because we do basically everything. So maybe a little self-serving, but I think that's the best policy. We've got another question that said, can you talk about the effect on uh, mitigation plans of the changes we've seen since Verma? So uh, I would think, I'm not gonna touch it, but can anyone talk about the effect on mitigation plans? Um, if you want to, if you don't, I'm happy to. I, yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe I can respond. You guys are probably the the perspective from the bar is probably the best place to start with this. I mean, mitigation is is part of uh, FINSA and FIRMA, and it's it's a tool we use to resolve national security risk. And and um, you know, with some level of frequency every year there are there are transactions that are cleared with mitigation and the committee you know i can tell you goes back to nova's comment early on about uh enforcement and the importance of enforcement i think we have at treasury really focused on the the mitigation and enforcement piece of our of our team and building out the resources to ensure that uh monitoring of, of mitigation agreements is robust and <clears throat> And that compliance is effective. I think having um, ha we're going to be publishing uh, in for notice and comment at some point in the short term enforcement guidelines, which will give uh, stakeholders and 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 the bar and um, and parties under mitigation agreements greater clarity on how we intend to use those authorities. But I think um, you know a mitigation is an important part of our toolkit and. Uh, it, we'll be using it in the future. We'll just be doing more on the enforcement side to make sure that parties are complying. Yeah, and I, and on the on the company side, I mean, it, it. I guess just you know, it's. I don't think a whole lot's changed in terms of the approach to mitigation agreement with Firma. I think it was it was, you know, mitigation is just something that was you know really started. It was interesting how it sort of got its formation starting in, in my time at Treasury. And it was very ad hoc. You know, you had uh, folks at Homeland Security running off and doing a, doing a mitigation agreement with a company and then coming back to the rest of Sipia saying, fait accompli, this is done. Uh, and so that's why the original FINSA bill and it's carried out through FIRMA makes it on a consensus basis um, to ensure that uh, there's a broad understanding of the national security elements uh, involved. And then all the players in the Sipia's table have the ability to weigh in on the appropriate mitigation for the United States. So, I mean, that's something that you tell clients going into the process that it's a consensus base, but be prepared. There are elements of a transaction that are going to carry these kind of risks and vulnerabilities. Um, and you want to, you want to be able to address it, be very transparent, uh, but understand that these things could be part of the requirements that CIFI is going to place on you. Uh, but the good part is that it's a consensus process. It's not as though one agency or one entity is going to bigfoot it and require you to take steps that aren't uh, appropriate uh, for the national security vulnerabilities presented. So, yeah, mitigation is an interesting area. When uh, when we were working on FIRMA in Congress, uh, to be honest, there was a great skepticism that uh, mitigation agreements were being appropriately monitored and enforced. 
you know, our view was that uh, after they're signed that, you know, Cepheus was folding them into paper airplanes and just throwing them and uh, nobody would really watch to see what happens. So there was a specific provision put in that requires the mitigation agreements be, you know, be verifiable, that they be uh, something Cepheus can monitor and that they'd be designed to actually be effective, not just to check the block. And I think uh, the excellent team that Thomas stood up over there at Treasury dealing with enforcement is a testament to the fact that they took that very seriously and they're using mitigation agreements appropriately. And I think they should be continued to be used to, uh, to make deals okay, to try to get things done. And, and so, um, yeah, I think I'll leave it there. This always happens when you come up to within uh, 10 minutes of the, the bell ringing, you get a flood of questions and I do that too. So uh, I, it's just human nature, I guess. Um, since we started a little late, can, can the three of you hang on maybe an extra five minutes? Because we have four questions, which are pretty good. So if, is that okay, Tom? No, sure, of course. Yeah, sure. Great. Um, let me start with one. This is, a, this is a good one. It's a hard one. Do you believe Chinese foreign investment has actually declined or is it simply changed form? And that's what I try and figure out myself. You guys want to start? Yeah, sure, <laughs> sure. I'll, I'll start. Yeah, I, I look. I think, I think it has slowed down. I think there's a number of reasons. I think China itself uh, slowed it down because um, it was seen as sort of a, a loss of foreign, foreign exchange, and I think they slowed down the process. So, yeah, I think to a definite degree it has slowed, but it has also changed uh, and shifted, right? And I think sort of some of the provisions for. Uh, uh, private equity entities with, uh, 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 in terms of who's the, you know, U.S. private equities in terms of their investments and whether they're covered transactions. I think more shifted investments have shifted into a non-controlling basis where they're minority, uh, minority partners, not the general partners, and their, their investments are in that scope. So I think the money is still out there. Not to the degree, I think, it, you know, in terms of the filings, you know, they went down by half. So I think, you know, certainly the Rodium group has put out some studies and, and, and a few others in terms of Chinese investment. So it's definitely slowed, but it's shifted as well. And so, um, you know, and that goes to the point where uh, 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 Dave was talking about where, you know, you, you got to be vigilant on the IP transfers, right? Are they just doing intellectual property transfers? And and so they're getting the good stuff without uh, having to get the overview. So I think that's just an element of vigilance that has to be continued. I shouldn't have I shouldn't have said what I said about questions because while you were talking, we got five more. But Dave, you were going to add something. So just I'm going to try and cover them all if we have time. So let me you know a little more short on the answers. Yeah. I don't have much more. I don't have much to add beyond what Nova did, so I'll just be brief. I think um, maybe it's it's backed off a little bit, but I think in most ways it's really just changed and and kind of gone behind the scenes. One interesting area that was uh, mentioned in Firma is bankruptcy as kind of a backdoor process, uh, mm -hmm. M&A or other types of uh, investments, and um, and that was specifically called out. And, and most of those deals are actually uh, review, reviewable by CFIUS. It's just a question of making the right parties aware. So I just flagged that, but we'll uh, stop for the sake of time. Maybe Tom, this one you should start with. But someone asked, "What are the what are your, what's your thinking on uh, new developments regarding CFIUS proximity concerns?" Um, well, I, I I think we've always paid attention to proximity uh, as a threat vector, uh, a, a risk, and we've been um, the real estate uh, uh, part of Firma also helped us with that. So I. I don't know that there's much of a change other than before it had to be a U.S. business that, you know, the investment in the U.S. business that posed the, the risk. And now we're able to look in, in certain defined circumstances. I th actually, I guess it was Nova that brought this up uh, to, um, to Greenfield investments uh, in property that could pose that similar risk. So we're paying attention in both contexts. Okay, great. Um, someone asked, I'll just read it. The Washington Post reported that CFIUS is probing past Chinese investment. How much of that is attributable to Firma? Um, how much of it is just because it's China? 
you can, uh, I, I sort of told Tom he could dodge this one. So you get a pass on this one if you want. I'm happy. I mean, I, you know, I, I mentioned earlier in our discussion, recent reporting about our, uh, the, the committee's work with respect to non-notified transactions. I have also said during this discussion that we're paying a great deal of attention to the non-notified function and to building out the resources there. So I think, I think connecting those two dots should be enough. Someone asked, we, we were actually, go ahead, I'm sorry, Dave. Yeah. I was just gonna say the, uh, you know, I think Tom had authority to do a lot of the things they're doing before FIRMA, but uh, the additional resources and the specific call out that Congress made on, on you know, focusing on non-notifieds is part of it, but I'm confident they would be doing a lot of this stuff anyway. They just now have the tools to do it, so. So we actually were talking about this one before the meeting started, which is um, what are the national con security concerns regarding the gaming industry and Tencent? And I don't know if any of you want to touch that one. Uh, I can say that I understand there's really good grounds for being concerned about WeChat, but what do you think about gaming? I suppose that, um, you know, I'm not an expert on, um, on uh, simulations and uh, you know, but but I suspect that a lot of the technologies that go into into gaming could be you know virtual reality, augmented reality could be used to train uh, fighter pilots or operators of other military equipment. And maybe that's part of it, but that's just uh, speculation. There may be a sensitive data element to it as well, but um, I don't honestly know, and I, I doubt Tom's going to shine a bright light on it for us. <laughs> well, let me go to another one then that maybe all three of you can opine on. Someone asked. What's going to lead to more non-notified transactions, the safe list or the change to using export controls and companies being able, perhaps, to countries being able to use license exceptions to avoid filing declarations? Tom, when you look at your workload, what do you think is going to be the major source of increase? Well, it's hard to say. I mean, there, there are a lot of, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure there's a correlation between the accepted foreign state list and non-notified work. I think I think over time, as the as the firma regulations mature and as the bar gets more familiar with them, I think you're going to see a natural um, uh, continuing migration of clear um, benign transactions to the declaration process for for a, a quick and efficient um, safe harbor letter and uh, a migration of, of more complicated cases to the full notice process. I think to um, you, you, uh, the increase, you, we may see an increase with respect to real estate. It, it really, there are a lot of things in play in terms of where we're gonna see the biggest uh, resource demand. I think the non-notified process will, it, it, it's, separate from that and we'll you know when we identify a transaction of concern that hasn't voluntarily filed we're going to pull the string and take a closer look just wonder that maybe all three of you can touch on someone asked is the scope of sensitive data as it's defined under CFIUS uh, does it appropriately reflect uh, national security concerns regarding data specifically with regard to China but I think in general too so I don't know who wants to start on that one. We don't want to let Tom grade his own homework on this one. So maybe what I'll just say is that I think <laughs> the, uh, the 10 or 11 specific types of sensitive data that are uh, enumerated in the, in the regulation, I think, I think they, they strike the right balance. You know, data is sort of the lifeblood of the modern economy in a lot of ways. So we, they didn't want to be, you know, overly broad, but I think they wanted to capture the right types of data where there's an actual national security risk that comes uniquely through through that investment, that non-controlling investment. So I'm a fan of the list of, uh, of sensitive types of sensitive personal data. I think they, I think they got it right. Yeah. So I, I, let me do, I was just going to say, sorry, Nova. Um, it's important to remember that that enumerated list of 10 categories is with respect to our new jurisdiction. There may be other types of data that may come into play in our traditional control jurisdiction. So be, folks should be careful to construe or infer that that's an exclusive list of data that the committee may be concerned about. So were you going to add anything? Not anything big, just that data is, you know, data is the gold 
um, of the new digital frontier and, uh, you know, with uh, European private privacy laws on data, uh, there's a lot moving in this part, uh, going all the way to cables being laid under the ocean. So it's an important area to watch and um, an important area for national security issues. So. Jim, I'll just add on that I was really glad that it's specifically on data that uh, in the regs that uh, Tom and Laura and their team specifically said that these regs are going to be updated and evolve over time because national security, you know, in January 2020, honestly was different than national security in October 2020. Now we have public health concerns that are part of national security, for example. So things will evolve on data and the regs need to evolve too. Unlike uh, the FINSA regs that Nova worked on, no offense, Nova, that weren't touched for over a decade. It's, we've got to make sure these things stay current. Yeah, we actually got a question on uh, the, whether, how COVID has affected CFIUS and how COVID might have seen a shift in Chinese investments in biotech, but if that, oh, the, the, my, we opened the floodgates here with questions. I can't keep up. Let me, uh, let me merge one that I think uh, you can all talk about. How often does CFIUS follow up in mitigation agreements? How big is the team that looks at them? How aggressive are they in looking at uh, non-notified transactions and finding them? So maybe Tom, you can start and then Nova and Dave, you can say what, uh, what you see from the outside. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure where to start. I'll, I'll say with your fir the first piece of your question before you rattled off that, that, that list, <laughs> uh, you know, we've, been, we've continued to be very busy during the course of the pandemic in terms of, of uh, transaction flow. This isn't just the pandemic in terms of a, of a number, but between uh, enactment of FIRMA in 2018 and today, the committee's cleared uh, over $400 billion in, in transactions. So we've been very busy. The, the committee's uh, continued to, to have a, a pretty um, steady rate of filings, uh, notices during um, during the pandemic. And I think this year we will exceed prior years in terms of the number of declarations filed. So uh, very busy. I think, you know, obviously the pandemic has affected um, you know, the, the rate of deal flow, that's just, I think, an obvious um, uh, conclusion to make. Uh, and, and with respect to how aggressively we look at non-notifieds, we, we look at, I, I wouldn't, I guess what I would, the, the question's sort of skewed. What we do is we look at uh, whether there's a national security risk associated with a transaction. We pull the string on the facts and circumstances. We look at whether it falls within our jurisdiction. And if we think it may pose a concern with respect to national security, we invite the parties to provide us more information and potentially file. And, that, and that's, you know, that, I mean, uh, the great thing about the FIRMA bill was it, it's, it, it, it's made the process much more formal. And, you know, that's how we had it as well. When any, any one agency identified a transaction that wasn't filed with CFIUS, they could bring it before the committee. Uh, we'd evaluate it. Um, the threshold sort of there was, you know, uh, did it seem as though this was one that was gonna be mitigated, uh, require some action? Uh, outside of that, you know, we didn't really wanna utilize too much resource, but a lot more resource. So um, obviously more can be uh, fielded and I think there's better ways of seeing what kind of information is out there. Just in terms of mitigation, in terms of uh, uh, the, the effectiveness of the, the committee to enforce and, and, and stay on top of the terms, I can tell you firsthand from you know, clients I had that they've been definitely active as well as Justice Department and others uh, in making sure that the terms are applied to. Well, I, we have time for two questions and then maybe some wrap up remarks if we, we came short. I wanna come back to the one, I don't remember if we answered or not. If I'm just losing my mind, let me know. But, um, is CFIUS, is the committee going to look at past Chinese investments? Uh, you know, Smithfield Ham was always a tricky one for me, but I don't, we'll take Tom off the spot on that and ask Nova and Dave, do you think it should go, are there transactions or do you think it's a general rule it should look, go back and reopen? And the classic example is... Uh, I, don't, I don't, I don't, well, yeah, I, I guess, I guess, you know, if, if a transaction has been reviewed by CFIUS already, you, you can't go back unless there's been some kind of 
uh, false information provided or a, a, a failure to abide by the mitigation terms. But in terms of transactions that have happened in the past that haven't been reviewed or have been seen, those are the non-notified ones I was talking about that require that uh, type of diligence. I think TikTok is an example of that. Uh, uh, and there's a number of others. And uh, from what I understand, uh, CFIUS is uh, going back and looking at some of those that are out there that have national security implications. I think the key thing to understand is that you know, maybe why the, when the transaction, ha I mean, well, any transaction that happens, you get an acquisition of a U.S. company and it has a certain periphery of its business that it operates or it does, right? But a company can grow. And when it grows, it expands in terms of the acquisition of information, whether it's PII, uh, business pr proprietary information of, of clients of theirs. So those things, if they haven't gotten addressed in the past, should maybe be addressed in the current. Uh, yeah, I, I think um, it's uh, I think it's fully appropriate to go back and review deals that never got safe harbor from CFIUS, but I think it could be very damaging to credibility um, of, our, of our system if we're to go back and, and reopen deals that CFIUS previously signed off on, unless there was in fact a lie or some kind of material misstatement of fact. I think that would be a bad, a bad policy, so. Oh, we, we've gotten, go ahead, we've gotten 23 questions since, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're not going to get them up to them all. So, sorry. Maybe we can answer them after the hearing, just like they I do. Uh, on the hill. Some of them are very specific, so they might be best asked, uh, you know, uh, on a bilateral basis. But I'm going to, I'm going to ask one, and then give uh, Tom the final world. And the, the, the one that I thought was interesting is somebody asked, where's the best place to put the line between what Treasury does and what Commerce does? Where's the place where Treasury's, Treasury's authorities begin and Commerce's authorities begin? So you're, you're merged in a way that wasn't true, say, five years ago, 10 years ago, in that there's greater linkage between the regulation. But where would you guys draw this line? Um, I, don't, I don't know how much the uh, I mean, and maybe Tom could speak to it because they, you know, they interoperate. Uh, but I mean, I don't know necessarily think the law has created greater interoperability. I think, you know, in terms of looking at the transaction, you always had to consider the export control implications. That's why commerce had the seat uh, and other stuff. So I think that still uh, remains probably not greatly changed. Um, but you know, certainly what's interesting is commerce has some uh, jurisdictions under an executive order uh, for certain telecom transactions to be able to take action on them. So I, I don't yet know how the two processes are operating in the CFIUS and uh, the powers that commerce has, the secretary himself, to take action under specific transactions. Uh, but uh, maybe I'll ask Tom at another point. There are a couple questions on uh, biotech and where does biotech fall as being considered a critical or foundational uh, technology, but I think we'll reserve them in the interests of time. I mean, that's one that might be more appropriate when we do get uh, people from commerce here to talk about that. Uh, we did get one question, so I can't, I can't resist asking it. Are there going to be any major announcements shortly after October 15th worth mentioning today? Um, uh, I can see that one. <laughs> I think uh, Nova was going to make an announcement about his favorite TikTok dance videos that day. <laughs> <laughs> we, we also talked about that, about how good the algorithm is at queuing up stuff that will keep you glued to the screen. Let me, um, let me I have not one. downloaded and will never download TikTok. <laughs> oh, you should. It's a lot of fun. And it's, it's I, I watch it. I mean, it's, it's great. Um, let me give everyone the final word, but I'm going to go Dave, Nova, and then Tom gets absolutely the final word. Dave, any final thoughts? Uh, you know, just um, nothing specific. Just appreciate the chance to be here and uh, the chance to talk about a topic that I think is really important. And uh, a lot of work has been has been done. A lot of progress has been made. I hope that whoever is the president next year, whatever administration is is uh, in power, I hope they continue the serious work. And and um, yeah, thanks again for having me. Thanks, Noah. Uh, yeah, I want to I want to thank uh, uh, David uh, for for pushing this bill through. Uh, it's definitely was needed and important in terms of us addressing uh, some of the negative negative sides of foreign investment, even though the vast majority 
doesn't carry the national security element and is good for the United States and good for our growth. But there are certain ones that have to be addressed and this bill did a lot to do it. I appreciate all that Tom is doing to make sure to run the process. I know how hard it is, but it's so critical that, you know, it, when you run a process, especially a consensus process like CFIUS, you know, decisions are made at each level and when they have to go up, eventually the principles there as a consensus made when they make that recommendation to the, to the president. That way you have a process that you can defend and share with other countries to say, this is the right way to make it work for, uh, for you because uh, it, it serves its process. And, and Tom, I'll tell you, I have a, a cheap metric for how successful you've been. And that is the number of times the media calls it the secret of CFIUS process or the mysterious CFIUS process. And the number's going down. You're not so secret anymore. That's good. But um, what would you say in conclusion? Yeah, just to that point, I, I kind of bristle at that whole black box notion. Part of, part of uh, you know, the law requires us to, to, by statute, information filed with the committee is supposed to be confidential. That actually positively reinforces the transparency that the, the parties engage with us on if they can trust that we're going to protect that information. And we take that really seriously. But other than that, you know, there's a lot of information on our website. We do a lot of engagement. We, um, and and we, we make ourselves available for questions and engagement, a lot of FAQs. We're working hard to make sure that we provide as much transparency and clarity as possible. And, and if you read our regulations, and I think both of my friends talked about this today, we took a great deal of care and time to provide as much detail and specificity as possible. So I think the black box thing is a little overblown. Uh, I, I'm, I'm grateful to, to have the invitation, Jim. It's great to see my two friends and, and to talk uh, about this. And uh, look, there is a lot of work left to be done. We'll be working to continue to build out the team, to continue to pay attention to to the regulations and the types of transactions we're seeing and, um, and to enforce the rules. Great, well, we covered a lot of ground today. So I appreciate all of you coming. Uh, Thomas Vetto, David Hankey, Nova Daly, thank you very much for this program.